She was 14 and he was 20. This is Conversations with Cousin Carly. Herpes could never. Herpes could never break me, could never again make me feel less of. Herpes can't take my sexy away from me. Herpes does not take my worth away. Herpes does not devalue me. Herpes can never. Hi, my name is Shayna Singleton, aka the Herpes Goddess, and I am the founder of Herpes Can Never, but we are not here to talk about herpes. This is Conversations with Carly, Rich and Divine Rising Cousin. How are you? Rich and Divine Rising, I'm great. How are you doing? I'm well. I'm happy to be back at this with you. A week, yes. it was more like a week and a half, too yeah. long. I yes. kind of slacked and I've seen the difference in myself. So I'm glad to be back on track. Definitely. Me too. All right. So we got a touchy topic today. Yes. Yes. Um, maybe I should put a trigger warning in front of this uh, <laughs> YouTube video. But recently I made a post and I posted when I was 14, a 20 year old man took my virginity. At the time, I thought he was 19, 19, 20. It is what it is. I went for the reach for the post. Um, mm-hmm. And we got a lot of Me Too things in the comment section. Um, for one, before we get into the comments, pause. Let's just talk about the post. Mm-hmm. I was 14 and a 20-year-old man took my virginity. I didn't realize that was wrong until I was 28 years old. hmm how many other women are having experiences like this and don't know that they might be molested, they're being molested or mm-hmm. raped in a way? Um, I always regretted the way I lost my virginity. Mm-hmm. So I'm at this point in my life where I feel like he took something from me. He was mm-hmm. very much aware of what he was doing. I was oblivious. I was young. I was gullible. I felt pressured. He was an older guy. I knew it. You know, I wanted to appease him. I didn't know much about anything. Um, Mm -hmm. He took the opportunity, maybe not the opportunity, but for me to have a real experience losing my identity, um, I feel like he took that from me. Mm -hmm. Because um, I think when I when I think of that, and when you when you say about taking experience, I think it's about the knowledge that you have on why you're approaching, who you're approaching. And I think that's the that's the part where the deception comes in. Number one, the age difference is already a thing. But I think when you're someone who's mentally aware that the age gap is there and you have certain reasons, especially for going for someone who has that um, who's that many years younger than you, it's intentional. It's intentionally deceptive. And I think it's playing on the naivety of the person that you're, that you're trying to get with. So I do agree with you. I do agree with you because people know what their intentions are. Yeah. People know what their intentions are and they know. And a lot of men um, who go with younger girls have an issue or don't really date women that are their age. Yeah. Or if they do, it's far in between. And so it's like they actively seek out younger women. (sighs) Let me put my Mm -hmm. foot in a man's shoes and I can't. Because the age difference, I get it. Once you hit, I feel 18, I really don't care about the age difference. Mm -hmm. But if this little girl... Right. 12, 13, 14, just little girls, period. Little girls. I don't understand how someone, even when I was 18, I wasn't looking at a 14-year-old. Right. So in my 20s, I know for sure if I zap back to my 20s, I'm not attracted to no teenager. I was barely attracted to people my age. Right. Of course, I had daddy issues. And then there was me losing my virginity to an older man, too. Right. But... Still, I the attraction, mean, the attraction to a child blows my mind. Mm-hmm. I've gotten into arguments with people who 
defend child molesters not in a damn they should be you know out here molesting children but they say it's a sickness it's a disease you gotta be and in some cases it's normalized in some cases it's normalized and i think it shows up number one in the way that children are sexualized in general children are very sexualized um and there's some people who take that to the next level they become sexually attracted so i've seen people like it's nothing in comparison it's nothing on the same level but there'll be people who um talk about a child's body in a certain way if they're wearing something like a bathing suit and they'll make mention of different things not to say that person's attracted to the child or anything like that however they place adult adjectives on young people and i think that's the first thing the second thing is yes i understand people are sick i understand um all of that and a part of it is they've learned that children can be sexualized they've learned that children can be sexualized through different ways through conversation through it happening to them um being normalized around them um and i think a part of it is i don't know how to say like it's normalized and it's like, I don't know how to, I'm, if I'm mumbling over my word, but it's like, they've been, they've been taught they've been and taught. Been socialized. They've been taught and been socialized to be attracted to younger people and to not think, not think anything of it. Um, and that's the crazy part for me. Yeah. It's, that's the crazy part for me. It's the, it's the actual attraction part. You know, because it's one thing to just say, you know, I'm gonna dupe this person just because, and I don't really want nothing with her, but yeah. But it's another thing to know that you fully want to do something sexual, you know, and emotionally with a with a person who with, with a child. Yeah. And you know that they're a child, so that's actively what you're seeking. Sometimes, even with just the black culture and growing up overhear things and I wouldn't think twice about it like um oh he's so handsome when he turns 18 tell him to call me or the um he's gonna be a heartbreaker you better be a- get a shotgun for that one mm-hmm. better get a shotgun for that one. exactly like a little girl you thinking about you got trouble on your hands mm-hmm. crazy all of that <laughs> Yeah, all of all that, of the amount of things that we've heard and seen, and this is why I say normalized is that when I was growing up, though, though all of those things sounded different to me, right? Um, my mom is 19 years younger than my father, so already in my household, at up to a certain point, that seemed regular. It would be regular in conversations for me, like say when I was in elementary school, to be like, oh, my mom's this and my dad's that. And I just thought it was a funny, like a quirky thing because I also have um, 15 brothers and sisters too. So I'm just thinking, you know, I grew up in a family where a lot of things are very unconventional. Um, But because I was so young and I was just so embracing and loving of my family when I'd go to school I'd be like yeah and I have this I have this many siblings and there's this many parents and my mom's this age my dad's that age um and my older brother's almost the same age as my mom and I would just say it because that's what it was right a lot of kids around me didn't end up thinking any they didn't say like "Ooh, nothing no a lot of you know what's funny though a lot of children that I met in elementary school, especially if they were had families, um, not necessarily from Canada, from different parts of the world, yeah. all told me that their father had a large age gap from their mother too. Okay. And so we kind of like, I'm thinking now as I'm talking, I could see some of my elementary friends in my head. And I just remember us feeling like it was normal. It was normal for that to happen. So then you pair that with the different comments that you hear people saying around. And it's just, that's what happens. At a certain point, I thought I'm gonna get me an older man. When I'm old, when I get older too, I'm gonna get me an older man. Got a lot of money like my dad did, and he's gonna take care of me. He's gonna do all of these things because this is the way you know. This is how families are made because of my young mind, right? And so this is what I mean by the normalization of it is growing up in a household. Not to say that um, it was encouraged, right? But from what you can take in, 
I see how there's girls who turn 14, 15 and end up saying, you know what? That's the one I want. That 30 year old man right there, that 21 year old man right there, whatever that, whichever grown one is there that I think is, is, is handsome. That's the one I want. And so I see how the trickle, how the trickle down plays in that regard. But on the flip side of it is little girls are expendable. Little girls are expendable in the eyes of a lot of people, little boys too, but they don't talk about it as much. Yeah. But children are expendable to a lot of adults. Children are tools to a lot of adults. And in some cases, sad to say sexual because it's less questions, right? It's less questions. It's less explanation. It's next, less, less of a challenge. Um, I don't know where the sexual part comes in because I, can, I personally cannot speak to that. Um, but I just see the way that people will use children. Yeah. There could be people who haven't developed enough socially, educationally, who feel like they can't even have a conversation with someone the same age as them. But a child, a child makes them feel smarter. A child makes them feel, you know what I'm saying? Stronger, bigger, um, more manly. Um, and I don't, I, I, so I'm talking in, in different places. So I'm trying to put myself in the, in the, in the actual place because where I'm at in, in my father actually having a big age gap between my mother and actually me living in it. So I'll say like this, from my mother's perspective, it was an opportunity, not even an opportunity. It was, she saw him as a man who was helping yeah. her situation a man who was helping her situation, um, a man who showed genuine interest. Um, in the age that she grew, in the time that she grew up in, mm -hmm. she saw this all the time. She yeah. saw this all the time. Um, when her family members found out, not to say they were all like cheering, but nobody stopped it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Everyone embraced it. Mm -hmm. It just became... Oh, that's Lisa's boyfriend. Yeah. Period. You know what I mean? There was never a, a big, no one ever stopped the situation. No one ever stopped the situation. There was never a point in terms of the different stories I've, I've heard, never a point where anybody said, you know, let's stop this. Yeah. Or even tried or attempted. You know what I mean? It was more about my mom sneaking around, people finding out and everybody just being like, oh, that's what it is. Yeah. Um. I can relate, but I can't relate. My mother and father are 16 years apart, but my father was murdered when I was three years old. So mm -hmm. I didn't know who he was. And um, for the longest time, the only stories that I had was the little bit of stories that I got from my mom and like the three memories that I had. Mm -hmm. um, after I got older, of course, I questioned and I asked and I really honed in on the age difference. And I'm like, mom, this man was 16 years older than you. And you tell me you met him in high school and it's the same situation. She was in Spanish Harlem, living in the projects. It was like a two bedroom, tiny as a project with her, with her sisters and her nephews and nieces. And, you know, they're poor. The, my mom used to have one outfit to her name, like, Sometimes all she had was coffee and crackers to eat. Um, he came in like the savior. Right. And was your mom's dad around? Um, no, he was around up to a certain point in her life. Maybe mm -hmm. early teens, preteens, he passed away. Right. So there's that. Um, but when my father came in, he is, you know, getting her wardrobe together. He's letting him, her drive his, teaching her how to drive and letting her drive his foreign cars to cars. high school. <laughs> um, did it up for her for her prom. Um, my grandmother didn't say anything because he's giving her money. I talked to mm -hmm. all my older cousins and they tell me how, you know, he will always, you know, hand them some cash. And it was like he was taking care of things. So he was embraced and he was accepted. Right. And, um, 
was gathering information from like my aunts and my cousins and my mother and now my father's side of the family, I've come to the conclusion that on my mom's side of the family, it didn't become a problem until they learned exactly who my father was. One, my mom did tell me he lied about his age. Okay. She didn't find out his real age until she um, went into his wallet and seen his ID. And I think maybe she was 18. Okay. But so for, for years, she didn't know. I, I think so. Okay. Um, but my grandmother, my mom was the baby. And her older, her older sister is 15 years older than her. So my grandmother is not, wasn't a spring chicken. I'm pretty sure she knew the deal. You know, she knew what was going on. But because of the money, my grandma too. <laughs> it was kind of left alone. Accepted. Yeah, it was accepted. Um, so yeah, there's that. If my father was alive, I think I would have a lot of questions for him. I think mm -hmm. about my life. Um my brother's father was nine years older than my mom. Niall's father is nine years older than me. I okay. dated somebody 12 years older than me before. Um, big daddy issues on my part. One, my father wasn't around anyway. And then I always used to put in my head, well, my mom and dad are 16 years apart. So as long as I don't go over that, Right, because I said, but, listen, after 19 years, you can't tell me nothing, <laughs> lady. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you see that that way of thinking is, this is how I say it gets, it gets trickled down into it. Because now a lot of girls base their, um, especially if they have that type of relationship, they base some of their milestones on things that their mom did. Yeah. You know what I mean? I used to think about the ages that my mom was when she had children. Um, the age that I knew about things. And so I, in my head, I'm like, listen, boo, at 15, you met him. At 18, um, no, 17, my mom had her first child, but my sister didn't survive. So 18, she, she had another baby. So now I just think about the different age groups, the ages that she was when she had children. So all these ages come in. And one of the biggest ones was like 19 years. If I do anything under 19 years, don't tell me nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Even though I was at, there was a period in my life when I was young where I was so upset from hearing the story, from hearing the story, even though I knew the crazy situation that my mother had grew up in. I knew about like the fact that my, my mother was the eldest girl. And so my mother used to help raise her siblings. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother's father was murdered when she was three. Um, from Harlem and then she lived in Canada and then she went back to Harlem in the summer times. And one of the times she was in Harlem is when she met my dad. My mom has a history of the women in her family leaving Canada, moving somewhere in the States and then that meeting their husband there. So I'm sure the same way that in my mind, I took certain things as this is the order. I'm sure in my mother's mind, there were certain considerations she had too. She saw the way that her aunts who lived in Canada and were just single and mm, ended up going to the United States, ended up finding men that would take care of their families, men that would take care of them, lock, stock and barrel. And so in her mind, I don't know if she ever thought that's how it would go, but I'm sure she was thinking, you know, I'm going to make sure that I have someone that can actually take care of me. Um, on the flip side of things, I know that my dad um, was often approached by older women when he was younger. Um, and so those were different stories that I would hear from him throughout time. Not to, He wouldn't say like, oh, this is the reasons why. But in his storytelling, because my dad has such a great memory, in his storytelling, I just remember different part, parts sticking out to me. Like, okay, it was a lot of older women, a lot of older women checking for my dad seeing him get home from school you know what I mean and then being like hey your name's Carl and you're so tall and all of these different things and a lot of the times he tells the stories and it's funny the things that you remember right it always starts with a woman telling him how big enough or grown he uh, grown enough he was to do x y and z so I could tell that 
in my dad's upbringing, he was molested as well. Yeah. You know? And so all these things play in my mind. For me, knowing my father, I could put a face to it, right? I could put a whole person to it. I'm not making excuses for it either, though. Because like I said, for for when I, in my childhood, when I heard the stories, I was just like, no, I can't talk to you. Until like, and yes, I'm, I'm here. And yes, I love my siblings. And yes, I love you very much. But I, it's going to take my little, <laughs> my little heart, some reckoning yeah. and some time to like, to piece together how this happened. Because my main thing as I was getting older was when I turned 15, can I go and date someone who's 19 years older than me? And the question was, the answer is always, hell no. Why? Hell no. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, you cannot. You cannot. And I think it's because probably in both my parents' mind, they at, at, at some point they realized this is wrong. Yeah. But they ended up making a commitment to each other, even though they weren't always in a full on relationship. They committed to being together. They committed to having five daughters together. Um, they ended up getting married years later. Um, so in their mind, what they had did was done, yeah. but their focus all the time was on making sure that their daughters did not end up in their situation. Like, it sounds real weird. I don't know if it's, if it makes any sense, but it's like, listen, we did the wrong things. Yeah. But our yes. daughters, like this can't happen with our daughters. This can't happen with our daughters. And mm -hmm. so we had rules placed on us and everything. We weren't allowed to date till we turned 18. So that eliminated that yeah. right off the bat. It's hot. You mentioned that and I'm like thinking, I'm thinking about my family and the dynamic. And I think about how um, my grandparents, uh, Ethel, daddy boy, mm -hmm. they were married. Mm -hmm. They had all the, they had 50, 11 kids together, okay? And mm -hmm. I think about their children, and that's not the same dynamic. Like, mm -hmm. none of them took that same approach. Um, and it makes me think about their marriage. And I wasn't around, I'm like, right. was Rocky? There's so many bits that no I one could have tried, no? Because I would say a lot um, of, our, of our aunts on that side were married. A lot of them were married. But no one has the same story. No. And no, but I think I, I kind of, I don't know. But I feel like the intention initially was to try to get there, but they didn't necessarily get there. The women are like extremely mean we are like the singleton women are known to have a mean streak so, so saying that oh that love you down but don't cross them or don't do mm -hmm. this like it's that that type of aura placed on the women and then i hear all these fairy tale stories about my grandmother and i'm like can somebody give me the real it was cara that actually gave me the real about mm -hmm. our grandmother and i'm like oh it makes sense when I start thinking about all the women and us even down to me and our character traits. But as far as the men go, they've all seen their father marry a woman, have all these children with one woman and have a household with the children, the grandchildren and the one woman. And yet my father was out here my uncles are out here. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm like, what are the missing pieces? What are y'all not telling us? What is someone not telling me? Like, what is the disconnect? How does that happen? Um, I think culture changes too. Yeah. I think culturally things change because if I'm not mistaken, um, Grandma Newt and Daddy Boy weren't originally in New York, right? They were I know they were south. Right. And that was the same. It was funny. They knew actually my great grandparent, well, my great grandmother and her husband at that time. Okay. Um, and they both like around the same time moved from there to Harlem. Um, and I think that was another change. I know in finding about, cause I'm big on finding out like, you know, family history and the stories and stuff like that. Harlem was a different world. Like yeah. New York was a different 
world once they got there. Um, I don't know what was happening in the ages that they were growing up in, because I know they were all born around like the late, what, late 50s, 60s type era. And then, right, you get from the 60s, that's what, is that wartime? That's that's assassinations yeah. happening. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that's more fifties. So by the time they're born, it's it's people getting assassinated every year. The crack, right? Yeah. It's crack era coming in. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a lot of stuff happening. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Money go, money dwindling. Yeah, getting it how you you know what I mean. So I see the way that the environment led to a lot that went down including dating men with with the dating the men who had the money in the time of squalor you know what i'm saying when everybody wasn't wasn't doing well when it wasn't like oh the whole heydays but even that a lot of people were end up were able to participate in the in the get money days because of the older men right yeah and so I see the way that it played out and having been, having been the daughter of one of the biggest hustlers in Harlem, I was able to see the way that I shared my father with the whole city. Yeah. I shared my father with the whole city. We used to come from Montreal, drive into the city and every corner, we'd have to go pee fresh off the highway, hungry, stinking, gotta go pee, gotta eat, want to brush our teeth. My dad got to stop on every corner because everybody's like, woo, woo, stop my dad, Bubba, stopping him, stopping him, wanting to give him the update, want to check on him, want to ask him for something, want to kind of ask him for something, want to tell a story. You know, your father used to such and such and such and such. So I see in retrospect, you know what I'm saying? I'm able to see based on how things are now. This is how y'all must have looked at him yeah. back in the day. And who would ever think to turn someone like that away? Yeah. You know what I mean? Especially if they're coming with the good vibes. A lot of our cousins say that he was the father they never had. You know what I mean? Um, my aunt, my mom's sisters, uh, my mom's family members. There's not too many people that are in my, that are in my family circle, even extended, 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 that won't say, oh, you know, your dad helped me with this before. Or, you know, my dad helped my, help, your dad helped my kids do this. So, you know, your dad used to put on parties and, you know, he used to do, do bus rides and all that stuff. And I see how all of that other stuff was muted. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it was like, okay, that happened. But look at this. Because homegirl over there got a boyfriend the same age as her. And what does he do? Nothing. You know what I mean? So I think, um, I think that was one of the reasons why it was excused. It was the culture. Yeah. It was the culture. Also around that time, the dudes that had money, they wanted girls that they could dress up and look pretty. They wanted girls to, so you are part of my, you're a part of my, you're a status symbol, yeah. right? Because I have money, I have cars, I have respect. You know what I mean? I have access, I have a beautiful home, I have opportunities. You're my woman now. Now I'm going to dress you up. So now you get the pretty things. Um, you know what I'm saying? You get the pretty things. You get the bragging rights. You get all of that stuff. And so when people see you out, it's like, oh, yeah, that's so-and-so's girl. You have protection now. So now little 14-year-old girl who is worried about the 15 older niggas on the block. Excuse my language. The 15 older men on the block. You don't got to worry about them no more because they know that you're my girl, right? Yeah. So all these different things culturally, I can see, I can see how it happened. Like I can see how it ended up happening, especially from seeing so many people. Like I used to assume was only my my mom, right? <laughs> that had the age group thing, the age no. different song. That <laughs> my mom. Until I start realizing, oh. Oh, y'all are all got this age different thing, different thing going on. Maybe not all 19 years, but you definitely was going, the grown men, you grown men were definitely going for the younger girl and you younger girl definitely saw something attractive, right? In, in that, in that image of what an older man would bring. Um, And truth be told, 
I think it's still that way till this day. I think it's still that way till this day. Um, older men, especially one who looks like he's not raggedy, you know what I'm saying? He doesn't look like the pervert, the yeah. pervert on the street with missing tooth and all of that stuff, right? Hollering at the girls, not him. It's the guy who can pull, who can get out of a luxury car, right? And puts on nice clothes and he got such pretty teeth and he knows how to talk to people. And, oh, did you know that he knows Diddy? And did you know that he knows so-and-so? You know what I mean? And I see the way that still is something, it's still something that goes goes along, goes around. And it's still something where people are finding opportunity in these relationships. And these men are still using younger girls to build up this ego that they're growing for mm-hmm. themselves. Yeah. Ooh, child. Look at this conversation and where it wanted to go. Mm-hmm. It made me look at my mom's situation a lot. It made made me look at her situation differently. Um, and I used to question, like, did you love my father? Mm-hmm. She can right, or did you want the? Mm-hmm. If she answered today, she'll probably say, "Tell me." Probably no. I didn't know what love was at that young age. Um, all I knew is that he came in. You know, my whole world. Like night and shining armor type deal. Yeah. Um, I know it got scary at some point, like around the time of his death for her and for my family. Um, but it kind of hit me different when I'm like, well, damn, my mom didn't love my father. <laughs> so I went mm-hmm. through that, that phase. Now I'm just in a trying to understand Right. Trying not to resent my father so much because I didn't have the opportunity to ask him the questions that I want to ask. Exactly. So and I actually go through it. Right. Go back and forth when it comes to my dad. Um, it's kind of like, damn, I wish I had my father. Everyone in the family, both sides of my family tells me all these great things about my dad. And yet mm-hmm. he made life choices that took him away from me. Mm-hmm. And the life choices that he made, he had this and this and this and that. But his daughter didn't benefit from any of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe like my three brothers, my two brothers and my sister from his wife benefited. But me and my other brother, we didn't benefit from none of that. So I think about that. That's the resentment from my father. The fact that he was murdered, Mm -hmm. one. Two, the fact that he left nothing back for his children. Three, the fact that he was in a position that took him away from his children. I could have meant much to him. Um, Four, how dare you be with some a 16-year-old little girl? <laughs> and then, um, yeah, that's about it. So I go back and forth. I go to the, oh, I love my dad. He was this and he was that. And everyone tells me great things. And to this day, when I go to Harlem, I'm going to have some grown ass men that I don't know crying to me, telling me stories about my father. Mm-hmm. And then it's all that that I just listed on the other side. Right. Back and forth. Um, I don't know. I think two, two, two things can be true at the same time. Yeah. Two things can be true at the same time. Um, like for me, um, certain people might think I don't have a place to speak on situations I see with older men taking advantage of younger girls because the first thing they'll turn around and say to me but what about your dad though my dad did what he did my dad did what he did I've reckoned everything that I need to reckon with my father Mm -hmm. it's not for so if I want to speak on something publicly I want to speak on something publicly and that's fine all the conversation and important conversations that needed to be had with between myself and my father who is still my father and doesn't stop being my father, whether I like the choices he made or not, um, it's still, it could still be true. Can mm-hmm. I be disappointed in the choices that my, I have a laundry list of situa- on, on things that my parent, both my parents have done. You know what I'm saying? Both my parents, that laundry list of things I hated. That's for me to reckon with them so that I, I can keep a relate, so I can figure out what type of relationship I want to have with them and keep it established and keep maintaining that. Like, I mean, we end up maintaining that one day or I could have maintained you know what dad I didn't really I can't cannot sit with it I can't make sense of it all the good things that you do and have done 
and the benefit that you have added to my life and the knowledge that I get from you having seen so much, you know what I'm saying? Having a father who is almost 80 has benefited me in, the, in a lot of ways, you know? There's a lot of people I know whose, pet, whose fathers are like maybe 50, 60 right now, but my dad knows more than their dads. My father has seen more than their fathers have. You know what I'm saying? My father knows more people. His network is bigger. So there's a lot of ways I've benefited from having an older father. Um, there's a lot of things I've learned through having this whole dynamic of my father having four uh, children with four women, um, having a, uh, a wife who was 19, who's 19 years older than him now, who now his wife, you know what I mean? So there's a lot of different ways that I, things that I've gotten from it and it's a part of my makeup. So I'm not going to all of us just deny it. I'm not going to pacify any situation when it comes to my father, but what I'm also not going to do is not speak on other things that I see. Yeah. You know what I mean? And some, some people might think, you know, you might want to just be quiet on it altogether because your father, no, we're not. And if you have something to say about my father, you could say it if you, if that's what you want to do. However, um, if I'm talking about a situation that's going on, I'm going to address it, whether or not my father and my mother have the age difference or not. Yeah. Because if I, like I said, if I was 15 years old again and showed up at my house with a man who was 34, that man would know very quickly that he showed up at the wrong house with the wrong girl. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's also that and that there's a lot of things that people have done and people do that they can. Um, I think the important part for me in the whole, in this whole conversation, not in this whole conversation, but when it comes to my father and my family is the reckoning that has to be done with the decisions that are made, the truth and honesty. You know what I mean? Because you could have someone who can just lie. You could have someone who says, you know what? Yeah, and I'm going to find me an even younger girl tomorrow. So, you know what I'm saying? And so that's the thing about it too is um, I think you have to. You have to speak on things. And that's why I say two, th two things can be true at the same time. I'm not going to not say something about it because you can, you can point someone in my family that has done it. There's a lot of people in my family you can point to that have done a lot of things. I'm still going to speak up on it when I see it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because that's one of the things on the list. That's one of the things on the list. You have to be, you, it's going to be possible that you can humanize someone um, who, has, who has taken actions that you did not, that you did not agree with. There are ways to humanize it, but that's my father. I don't have to do that for anybody else. I didn't have to do it for him. You know what I mean? So yeah. I could vehemently, <laughs> I could vehemently go hard about somebody now if someone who, who's their daughter or their family member wants to come in and say, well, you know, this is how I feel about it. They have their right to, too, but it's not going to stop me from speaking up on stuff because the truth is the truth. Yep. Ooh, this was a conversation. Yes. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> oh, there was some healing done during this conversation. Um, I thought I'd be able to read the comments. Um, if you guys are listening, then go ahead to my TikTok or go to my Instagram. Um, the post that I made is there. And you can read the comments. And there's a lot of me too's. There's a lot of women saying, oh, I was 15, he was 22, or just the same age gap. Excuse me. And saying they didn't notice it was wrong until they were older. Mm -hmm. Or people saying, oh, that's where my trauma went. You know, it's like an aha moment once they hit the age and they can put themselves in the shoes of the person who took their identity. Um, mm -hmm. It made me sad. Uh, it made me think, how do we change this narrative? Not only for our little girls, but for our little boys as well. Um, how can we have that conversation you were fortunate, you know what I'm saying? Like you got your mother and your father and you have a father who's adamant on letting you know that that's not going to happen. There's no way that you're gonna bring this grown ass man over here. Mm -hmm. But in a ways too, you could have still did it behind their back. You know, when I lost my virginity, that was behind my mother's back. She wasn't aware of what was going on with me. So what conversation do we need to have with our children to prevent these things? I'm happy. Right. And I think that's the, the biggest part is that because it already had happened, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. there was uh, there was no guesswork or no ignorance that the conversation needed to happen i think in in families where it necessarily hasn't has it shown up they don't think about the conversation that needs to be had around it it doesn't seem like a reality right Mm -hmm. And a lot of, for a lot of people, it doesn't seem to hear about it from this to this, but if it's actually something, if your household is a product of that, the conversations are definitely going to be different. You know what I mean? And I, so I think what it is, is, um, be aware, be aware of the ship is, sorry, I keep cussing, be aware of the things that are happening in this world. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Take note of the different stories you hear. So like, say, so let's say me, I'm not a parent yet, but because certain, a lot of things have happened in my family, there's certain things I'll know to speak about. Um, molestation was always spoken about in my household, always from different situations, from things that have happened to my, my mom when she was younger, um, like a lot younger than 15. Um, other people in my family, um, because it was something that people that that happened and my mother had a scope on and my father had a scope on because they had a scope for certain things the conversations always happen um and that's for that's i don't know if that's a good or bad thing because they were just extremely exposed to a lot of crazy stuff that they were therefore able to speak on with their children but um don't pretend that you i feel like people need to not pretend that we live in some type of fantasy world you know where stuff doesn't happen every day so you've got to kind of prepare your children of course at appropriate age levels for different things Mm -hmm. but i think there's not too many there's not too many situations that happen in this world period that we shouldn't put our like inform our kids on or put them on to you know you made me think about you mentioned scope (laughs) and i put this a part of my caption and i mentioned r kelly Mm-hmm. And I saw like a divide in opinions when it came to R. Kelly. One, I just think that Black women are the most unprotected, most un- unprotected individual in the United States of America, point blank, period. And the reason why R. Kelly wasn't crucified since Aaliyah and since having a, a sex tape with a 14 year old child pissing on her is because of that reason. It's because we're not white. Black women are not white. Mm -hmm. So I automatically jump to the defense of the Black woman when it comes down to the R. Kelly situation. But what was hurtful for me was to see, not necessarily my mom's side, but a lot of people from my Black family who grew up with R. Kelly. One side grew up with Celia Cruz, Mark Anthony, and Hector Lavoie. The other side grew up with R. Kelly. And because his music is so prominent, they jump to the defense of R. Kelly. Well, I'm not going to stop listening to him. And I've seen certain cousins say, well, those girls were being too fast. They want to be hot in the pants. And that's what happens. And it was so many excuses made. And I think, damn, you're so publicly willing to say that a little girl's being grown or being hot in the pants. Yet you don't know if that's your daughter's situation. Now you just close the conversation up because you're publicly just being so judgmental and defending a man that doesn't deserve to be defended just because he makes great women, I mean, great women, great music. (laughs) You're doing that publicly and you're shutting the door on that conversation. It's funny enough, I made a comment and it wasn't even, it was literally in, in saying that people needed to watch the documentary. Mm-hmm. before they uh, like were going ham on the people who were saying, I'm not listening to R. Kelly anymore. And I made a comment to it and somebody decided to comment on me. Well, what about your father? Is he R. Kelly? Because like to my recollection, there was a large age gauge gap between him and my aunt. Yeah. And the first thing I got was upset, right? Because I'm like, but I'm like, you know what? So call my father. Call my father and ask and ask him if he's R. Kelly, if this is what you'd like to post. And it was on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like it was a private conversation. So, okay. So now you want to bring my father into it. So now what I want you to do is I want you to call my father and I want you to ask him, is he R. Kelly? Don't ask me if my father's R. Kelly, go call my dad that you have a relationship with. Call him and ask him if he's R. Kelly. Number two, 
if this do you have something to say about it or can you not can you not separate the two right or can you not say that this is wrong because you also can't reckon with the fact that what you thought happened with my father and other men in your family and possibly your father too that it was wrong and because you can't because you admitting that to yourself or you haven't admitted that to yourself in this many years of living if you now admit it your love will be lost for the men that are all around you i've already reckoned with it so that i can still speak about it Mm-hmm. Like I said, two things can be true at the same time. However, for some people, they are so one-minded and close-minded that if I love a molester in my life, I'm gonna. I can't. I can't. I can't go against um, other molesters in public. Ooh, you know what I mean. But it's like cool. that's more telling of what you need to reckon with in your soul because the fact that you brought up my father right away is, means it's something that you've been battling with. Yeah. So maybe that's a conversation that you need to have with my father, you can your use. father. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe yeah. these are conversations that you need to have because clearly there's an internal battle going on and you'd rather sit on one side to feel comfortable because if not, then your whole childhood breaks up. Yeah. Your whole childhood gets shattered. Your adulthood gets shattered. The way that you shower so many men in public that you, but other people are calling mo- like things that they're calling R. Kelly a molester for, you showered certain men. Yeah. And so now you can't undo that and you don't know how to sit with it. That's not my problem. Yeah. But no, my father is not R. Kelly. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, my father is not R. Kelly. However, you just placed that into, yeah. the, into it, right? Um, and so I've definitely, I've dealt with that too, is the public thing, like as if I can't speak on it because of, of the situation yeah. how That but, has nothing but, to do with you though. You could still right. speak with it. It's, it. Right. You can't, you weren't right. even there. <laughs> right. But also I've had the conversations with my own father where I don't have to bring him up on Facebook. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've had these conversations already. There's nothing um, still sitting in my spirit. Yeah regarding regarding my father and some other people that I know that clearly are older than their than their wives or babies mothers Ooh, you know what I'm saying said that. it make me look at some of my cousins who had so much to say about it differently or understand a little bit more of why their opinions may be their opinions I think it what could be that it could be that because they actually were in the situation themselves. Yeah, you and there's a lot of family members that are being right. protected. <laughs> you know, right. down to my dad, their uncle. So, <laughs> so, um, so it's all these, so right. It's all these different things. Because if I do that, then that breaks all that down. But you'll talk about other things that have happened. You know what I'm saying? So I think there's, um, and I know we're talking a lot about this, but I think there's. Um, a reality that people have to face is that you can love someone and still tell the truth about the things that they've done. Yeah. Or, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And just because you've loved someone who you like, you don't know R. Kelly. No, you don't don't know that. You don't know that. You don't know that man. And you know what? If you still want to listen to his music, you go ahead and do it. But what I won't accept is people lying to themselves and then trying to lie to me. Yeah. Because I think that's usually where it comes out. And I think that's the, the, the situation that all of us are going to have to deal with. Like, even when you talk about this topic, I'm like, mm, this is sensitive. However, it's the truth. And it's kind of necessary it's the truth. to talk about. It's very it. necessary. Because the fact that so many people jump to defend a grown ass man. And then and um, not, not the children. And just kind of like. Those and not, I wish, oh, you know, I'm sad for that little girl. I'm sad that she didn't have more protection. It wasn't, I was, I was sad. It wasn't nothing for the little, for the little girl, little girls, not just little girl. It was nothing. Girls. I know, but my, my, I know exactly, exactly. And that's the crazy part is that I know about Aaliyah and it's, but like I said, normalization growing up. So thinking, normal. We didn't. When that's, that's her man. Oh my God, really? Yeah, that's her man. I remember being a little girl and listening in on my stepfather talking to the guys. It was like mm-hmm. the talk of the town about R. Kelly's sex tape and what he did and how he pissed on the girl. It was a joke in um, Dave Chappelle's comedy right. sketch. Like 
it's so normal. <laughs> right. It's ridiculous. And it, it, again, it blew my mind how people were so quickly to say, well, those little girls were grown or they were hot in their hands. And if they want to be out here hot, then they deserve that. But it was never once, R. Kelly is wrong. Mm-hmm. It was, he makes good music. I'm not going to stop listening to Steph in the name of love just because, you know, those little girls wanted to be grown. It was that mindset that blew me and made me look it's at like the, it's, it's like the grooming. Um, it's like the provision of things that she would have never got or these girls would have never got. You know what I mean? The manipulation yeah. that gets ignored that that w- sure worries me. And while you were saying that, I just thought about um, like little boys who get molested by their babysitter. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, you got some? You know what I'm saying? There's like, there's literally only one time a man said to me, honest, like, oh, like I lost my virginity to my babysitter. And I was like, oh, because in the past, I had always heard men talk about it a certain way. And he said to me, like, no, I was, I was molested. And that was the first time ever I'd heard a man say that in relation to, like, because everybody else that I heard, it was always, oh, my babysitter, my babysitter, my babysitter, my babysitter. I'm like, this is what crazy. is going on? How? It's all, all of y'all with y'all babysitters? And it's all just the babysitters is a little bit older, at least. You know what I'm saying? And the way that it's just so casual casual or like and normal like well yeah that's what little boys do you know little boys always end up getting getting something to babysitter like what that's like the little the boozy story when he talked about how he paid someone um to give fellatio to his what 12 year old or 14 year old son because he don't need his son being gay right sexualizing little kids Sexualizing a little kid. That's your child. Right. When maybe he wasn't even ready for all of that. Right. Because you don't want him to be gay. Right. What is someone going giving performing oral on your child? Is that's not going to make listen. Sexualizing children. Sexualizing Mm -hmm. children. It comes. It looks. It looks. It looks like a bunch of things. Ooh. It looks like a bunch of things, and people don't realize how they're how they feed into that. Not, I wouldn't call it grooming nature, but they they feed into that thought process of like this is what's supposed to happen. To the point where a kid might hear certain like certain conversations like that happen with their parents and be like, "Well, why not go sleep with the the twenty year old?" Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm happy we had this conversation. Um, yeah, me too. It's necessary. Uh, some of our family members may have it, may not have gotten it right, but hopefully the family, not hopefully, the family that comes after us will get it right. Yes. Um, because we are having these conversations. And that's just something different, period, because I didn't have these conversations growing up. Um, mm-hmm. Sex wasn't a topic. I wasn't talking about sex with my family members. Um, I was exploring with cousins. I was exploring with other little kids. I was mm-hmm. watching porn. I was learning from other kid children right. and not the adults in my family. So I just hope that with the generations after me, we can get to the point where sex is a normal conversation. Right. Even amongst the children. Yeah. Right? So that there's no secrets being held. I want it to be freely. I want to be a grandma and my grandson or granddaughter is telling me about their sex experience and they need advice. I want Mm -hmm. it to be that comfortable and normal in our family. I don't want people to have to have sex. feel like they're doing something wrong or they can't talk about this or they're going to get in trouble or their older cousin or aunt already said is that they're being fast in the pants or too grown. So now they don't want to even share their experience because I done said they were being fast or too grown on and said another 14 year old little girl was being too fast or too grown. Mm-hmm. I want to really change that narrative. So this, it starts here. Cousin, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. If you guys are listening in, I would love to hear your stories. Go ahead to the comment section and let us know what you think. Were you younger? when you lost your virginity 
Did you lose your virginity to an older guy? Do you have parents with um, large age gaps? How do you feel about the R. Kelly situation? Um, it's an open platform. I would love to hear it. Thank y'all. Yes. This is Conversations with Cousin Carly.